Hi, and welcome to Radonc Talks, a lecture series designed for students and residents of radiation oncology. My name is Rhea. I am currently a PGY4 resident at the University of Pittsburgh, and today we will be continuing our journey through the breast cancer series with a discussion on early stage breast cancer. My goal in this talk is to provide an overview of some of the most important trials that I think are relevant to early stage breast cancer. Um, we won't get into every single detail of each trial um, or every single trial that has been done because that's just too much information to get through. Um, there's really a lot of literature in breast cancer and it would be impossible to cover all of it. Um, but what my hope is to try to present these articles and kind of a straightforward way um, to kind of tell the story of how our understanding of early stage breast cancer has evolved and kind of give a rationale for why we do what we do um, with these seminal trials as evidence. So the very first thing we need to understand when it comes to radiation for breast cancer is that the role of radiation is to provide a local control benefit. And in early stage breast cancer, it used to be that we would do a mastectomy and completely remove the breast. But what we actually learned is that doing breast conserving surgery, so a lumpectomy or a segmental mastectomy, followed by radiation to the whole breast, was actually um, equivalent to a mastectomy. So let's look at some of those studies and uh, kind of get into the evidence base for this. So the NSABP studies are studies that you'll hear about a lot in breast cancer. NSABP stands for the National Surgical Adjuvant Breast and Bowels Project. And this is a cooperative group um, that I think came out of the NRG. And they basically ran um, a ton of trials. Their protocols are labeled one to, I think there's over 50 now. Um, but a lot of the important literature that we cite for breast cancer is from these NSABP trials. So... This particular trial, NSAPP B04, was a trial comparing um, radical mastectomy to total mastectomy. So it used to be that all patients with breast cancer would undergo something called the Halstead radical mastectomy, which involved on-block resection of the entire breast, the muscles of the chest wall, so including the pec major and minor, as well as the axilla. And as you can imagine, that was a very invasive procedure, and it resulted in um, really drastic um, functional decline for women with this Halstead radical mastectomy. And so NSABP B04 ran in the 70s, and they involved both clinically node negative and clinically node positive patients, and they compared radical mastectomy to total mastectomy. In the node negative arm, uh, they had two separate arms for total mastectomy. So either total mastectomy with axillary dissection down the road if the nodes became positive, or total mastectomy plus regional nodal irradiation, um, including the axilla, supraclavicular nodes, and the IMN nodes. Um, in the node positive arm, the patients either received a radical mastectomy or they received a total mastectomy followed by radiation. The key takeaway from this trial is that there was no significant difference in the distant disease-free survival or the overall survival after total mastectomy alone versus total mastectomy plus radiation in both the node negative and the node positive patients. Also in the node negative patients, they really didn't see a significant benefit to adding radiation to the total mastectomy. And so the key takeaway from this trial is that it kind of eliminated Halstead radical mastectomy as a standard of care, whether patients were clinically node negative or node positive. Um, so all of these patients were now able to get a total mastectomy instead of that very aggressive radical mastectomy. And this trial also showed that there was no survival advantage for post-mastectomy radiation in patients that had clinically node negative disease. So the bottom line for NSABP B04 is that we don't need to be doing radical mastectomy and adding radiation after mastectomy in patients that have early stage breast cancer, so clinically node negative disease, doesn't really add a local control benefit. And if you have a hard time remembering all of these trials, which I do, I try to think of silly ways to kind of remember these things. So I think of NSABP B4 as kind of being 
before, um, in times before, we used to do a radical mastectomy, um, but now we know that we don't have to do that and we can do a total mastectomy, which is less invasive. So NSABP B4 um, was a trial of the olden days. Before we used to do radical, now we can do total mastectomy. So hopefully that helps to remember this one. Following NSABP B4, which told us that we can get away with a total mastectomy as opposed to a radical mastectomy, the next question was, well, do we have to do a mastectomy at all? Can we get away with breast conserving surgery? And so that's exactly what NSABP B6 tried to answer. Um, and this trial ran uh, later in the 70s into the early 80s, and they took patients with stage 1 to 2 breast cancer, tumor less than 4 centimeters, they could have had plus or minus positive lymph nodes, and they were randomized to either total mastectomy and axillary lymph node dissection, lumpectomy and axillary lymph node dissection with a mastectomy if they still had a positive margin, or lumpectomy and axillary lymph node dissection plus radiation. And the radiation consisted of 50 gray to the breast only without a boost. And another important note is that if patients turned out to be clinically node positive, they also received um, chemotherapy, melphalan and fluorouracil, which is kind of an outdated um, chemotherapy regimen. So very importantly, what they found is that there was no significant difference in the disease-free survival or the overall survival between the three arms. So you're not compromising OS or DFS by doing breast conserving surgery, even if you don't follow up with radiation. There's no survival benefit to the mastectomy. And that is super important um, to realize. So that tells us that maybe we don't need to be doing mastectomy in these patients and we can get away with breast conserving surgery. However, when they compared the arms um, of lumpectomy alone versus lumpectomy plus irradiation, what they found is that the radiation decreased the chance of ipsilateral breast recurrence. So at 20 years, the risk of recurrence was 39% with lumpectomy alone versus 14% with the addition of radiation. And this was independent of nodal status, and this was a significant improvement to local control, so ipsilateral um, breast tumor recurrence with the addition of radiation. So NSABP6 is really important because it tells us that lumpectomy and radiation significantly reduces the ipsilateral um, breast tumor recurrence from 39% to 14%, and the survival is the same as if we did a mastectomy. So that's where we get the rationale that breast conserving surgery followed by radiation provides equivalent outcomes to a mastectomy. And um, the other key thing to remember is that these patients do need long-term follow-up because what they realized is that 30% of the recurrences occurred after 10 years of follow-up in the lumpectomy plus radiation group. So these patients really do need long-term follow-up. But the good news is they maybe don't need a mastectomy and we can do breast conserving surgery plus radiation. And if you need a silly way of remembering this, um, I think of NSABP B6 as be sexy, preserve the breast. And so this was a trial of breast conserving surgery plus radiation. Aside from NSABP, um, EBCTCG, which is the early Breast Cancer Trialists Collaborative Group is another group um, that has a lot of uh, studies pertinent to breast cancer. And they performed a meta-analysis uh, for early stage breast cancer, um, which kind of reinforces the role of radiation after breast conserving surgery. So this is a meta-analysis of over 10,000 patients across 17 trials, looking at breast conserving surgery plus or minus adjuvant radiation. And the 10-year uh, recurrence, local or distant, was 35% with breast conserving surgery alone versus 19% with breast conserving surgery and radiation. And this was a significant difference. Um, over 75% of the recurrences were local regional without radiation, but less than 50% of them were local regional with the radiation. Um, the absolute difference in the improvement was about 15.7% at year 10, so about 16%. And the improvement in the breast cancer-specific mortality was about 4% at year 15, which is a 4 to 1 ratio. 
And so this EBCTCG meta-analysis is often cited because it shows that radiation after breast conserving surgery substantially reduces the risk of both local and distant recurrence. It just about halves it, if you think about it, from about 35% to 19%. And that ratio of the absolute difference in local regional local recurrence versus breast cancer specific mortality is four to one. Um, and so from this study, we, we get this um, quote that on average, about one breast cancer death is avoided at year 15 for every four recurrences that you avoid at year 10. Um, and that's where that four to one ratio comes from is from this EBCTCG meta analysis. Everything we've talked about so far is super critical to understand. So let's take a pause here and kind of go through the the major takeaways. Um, So we presented NSAPP B4, B6, and the EBCTCG meta-analysis. And from NSAPP B6 and the EBCTCG meta-analysis, what we saw is that an early stage breast cancer After breast conserving surgery, adjuvant radiation approximately halves the rate of recurrence. So think of it in older studies, there was about a 30% give or take recurrence of risk after surgery, and this was reduced to somewhere around 15% with the addition of radiation. Nowadays, local regional recurrence is even better than that. Um, We typically think of it as around 15% without radiation, 8% with radiation, and nowadays we have hormonal therapy as well, which reduces it even further to 2 to 3%. Um, And the reason that we see these improvements is because we now have mammographic screening, which allows for earlier detection. We have improved surgical techniques, including image-guided surgery that allows for seed localization, intraoperative mammography, and we can better assess for adequate margins. We do offer a radiation boost as well, which we will talk about in just a minute here. Um, And then, of course, the improved systemic treatment. So we have endocrine therapy, and we also have chemotherapy as options. So I think the key takeaways from the studies presented so far is that, number one, from NSABPB4, nobody should be getting a radical mastectomy at this point. It's a total mastectomy. Um, NSABP B6 tells us that lumpectomy plus radiation is equivalent to a total mastectomy and that EBCTCG meta-analysis kind of reinforces that treatment paradigm of breast conserving surgery followed by radiation. And with the adjuvant radiation following breast conserving surgery, um, it approximately halves the rate of recurrence of breast cancer. I just mentioned something um, in that last slide there. I mentioned that nowadays we also think about offering a boost. Um, And so let's spend a few minutes um, looking at some of those trials um, that investigated boost versus no boost and talk about who benefits the most from boost. Um, The key takeaways to keep in mind from the trials I will present now are that tumor bed boost does decrease the ipsilateral breast tumor recurrence in pretty much everyone. It helps to it helps with additional local control. But there's a cost, and the cost of it is worse toxicity, right? So after a boost, um, patients tend to have worse fibrosis. And so it's a risk versus benefits situation, and it's all about maximizing the benefits while um, you know, keeping in mind that these risks are unavoidable of worse fibrosis with the boost. So let me present a couple of these trials here, and then we'll wrap it up and talk about who benefits the most from the boost. One of the most infamous boost versus no boost trials is the European EORTC 22881 trial that um, randomized patients to boost versus no boost. So this trial um, ran in the 90s, and they had participants that were less than 70 years old with early stage breast cancer. Um, T1 to T2, N0 to N1, um, who had had macroscopically complete local excision and axillary lymph node dissection. And these patients were randomized depending on if they had a positive or negative margin. So 95% of the patients had a margin that was negative, and they were randomized to either 50 gray of radiation with no boost or 50 gray of radiation with a 15 to 16 gray boost. And then the patients that had a positive margin all received a boost, but they were randomized to either 50 gray plus a 10 gray boost 
or 50 gray plus a 25 to 26 gray boost. And the results showed that um, there was significantly improved local recurrence with a boost in the margin negative patients that were randomized to boost versus no boost. So at 20 years, um, the improvement in local recurrence in the entire cohort was about 16% versus 12%. So 4% absolute improvement in local recurrence. However, they also noted that there was significantly worse fibrosis with a boost, about 2% with no boost versus 5% with a boost at 20 years, severe fibrosis. So um, this tells us that the boost does offer a significant local control benefit, but there's worse fibrosis at 20 years. When they looked at the margin positive patients, remember all of these patients received a boost, and what they found is that there was no significant difference in the local recurrence at 10 years, but they had significantly worse fibrosis with the higher boost. So 54% of patients in the 25 to 26 gray arm had um, fibrosis, at least moderate fibrosis, and 14% had severe fibrosis versus 24 and 3% in the 10 gray boost arm. So the, the latter part of the study in the margin positive patients tells us that boost certainly does not need to be more than 10 gray. Um, it doesn't need to be 25 to 26 gray. That's just a lot of radiation. And in the margin negative patients, we see that there is some improvement in the local recurrence, but there is also that cost of worse fibrosis with the boost. So they actually performed a deeper dive and did a subset analysis. And in this EORTC study, what they found is that there was the greatest magnitude of benefit from the boost was seen in three particular groups. And these groups were patients that were age less than 50, patients that were high grade, and patients that had adjacent DCIS in addition to the invasive component of their cancer. So young age, less than 50, high grade disease, and the benefit of this was seen in the first five years, and then adjacent DCIS was associated with actually a long-term benefit. And if you look at the curves on the right side of the screen here, um, it kind of shows the 10-year local recurrence divided by age group. So you can see that the separation between the two curves for age less than 40 and age less than 50 is a lot more dramatic than that seen in the patients that are 50 to 60 or 60 to 70 years old. So the subset analysis really provides us with, I think, the most valuable information here. And it tells us that everyone benefits from a boost. But since we know that the boost is associated with worse fibrosis, the question is who benefits the most? Because those are probably the patients that we should be prioritizing the boost for. And so these patients, based on the subset analysis, are patients that are less than 50 years old, patients that have high-grade disease, or patients that have um, adjacent DCIS in this study. And then remember from the previous um, slide where they looked at the margin-positive patients, remember that there was no benefit to a higher boost of 26 gray, um, and it was significantly worse fibrosis compared to the 10 gray boost. So 10 gray boost is probably sufficient. And so that's the EORTC boost versus no boost trial. The other trial um, that's, that's cited for uh, boost versus no boost is this French uh, Lyon trial or Lyon trial. Um, and so in this French trial, um, which also ran in the late 80s to early 90s, they took around 1,000 patients with early stage invasive ductal carcinoma, less than 3 centimeter tumor, negative margins, and they randomized them to either 50 gray and 25 fractions with no boost, or the same radiation with 10 gray and four fractions boost. And this trial also showed a significantly improved local regional recurrence at five years. So it was three and a half percent with the boost um, versus four and a half percent without the boost. So about a percent absolute improvement in the local recurrence. And the disease-free survival was also significantly improved with the boost, 86% with the boost versus 82% without the boost. And in terms of toxicity, um, there was significantly worse grade 1 to 2 telangiectasias uh, with the boost, so 12% with the boost versus 6% without the boost, so right around double. 
Um, but the physician and patient reported outcomes were good to excellent with no poor outcomes. And so this French Lyon trial is another um, trial, and oftentimes we'll use the regimen 10 gray in four fractions boost based on this trial. And um, it's with the understanding that boost reduces the local failure, and we see overall good cosmesis at five years. Let's pause again then to kind of summarize what we've learned from the EORTC and the French Lyon boost versus no boost trials. So remember, EORTC, we learned that um, in, in patients with a positive margin who all ways receive a boost, there was no benefit to that higher dose. So 10 gray was sufficient for them. In patients that had a negative margin who received a boost, everybody derived some local control benefit, but the magnitude of that benefit was highest in patients that were of young age or had high grade. And so from there, um, the 2018 Astro Consensus Guidelines actually pretty much summarize exactly that. Um, and they, they recommend a boost for any patients that are 50 years or younger, anyone that's older than 50, 50 to 70 years old with high grade disease, or patients that have positive margins. They do not recommend boost for patients that are older than 70, that have hormone positive, low to intermediate breast cancer, and negative margins that are greater than two millimeters clear. So my kind of takeaways and general rules for breast boost are age less than or equal to 50 years old, pretty much anybody with high grade disease or positive margins. And the dose that we use is typically 12.5 gray in five fractions or 10 gray in four fractions based on that French Lyon trial. Now, this is, it's not a black and white decision, boost versus no boost. And there are always other situations in which we kind of consider giving a boost. Um, so some of these examples I've listed here below. So unfavor, hist unfavorable histology is one of them. Um, for example, if a patient has triple negative disease or HER2 positive disease, you might consider a boost. If a patient has node positive disease, that tells you that the cancer is more aggressive. It has already spread to the lymph nodes. So it you know, you may consider giving a boost there. If patients are receiving chemotherapy, um, remember in breast cancer overview, we talked about various reasons that patients might receive chemotherapy, but typically these are higher risk patients, and so you would consider a boost in these patients. Another um, reason to consider boost is something called extensive intraductal component, or EIC, and that's when over 25% of the tumor on pathology is has a DCIS component. Some physicians argue that this is not as important in the modern era when the margin status is adequately checked, because remember, for DCIS, we consider a clear margin at least 2 millimeters, um, but I think traditionally, extensive introductal component was always considered a risk factor. And it was one of those risk factors that was pointed out in the EORTC boost versus no boost trial. So these are just some additional nuances to consider when you're thinking about boost. I think the key takeaway here is that boost benefits everybody, but it does have a higher risk of toxicity. So worse fibrosis, worse telangiectasias. And based on the EORTC trial, we know that the greatest magnitude of benefit is in higher risk patients. And so who are those patients? The key takeaways are young patients, so 50 years or younger, high grade disease, or if they have a positive margin. So that is a summary of boost for you. Aside from the delivery of boost, another uh, kind of key um, coming of age factor that has kind of revolutionized our care of patients with breast cancer is the use of endocrine therapy for hormone positive patients. Remember, a lot of these trials that we've talked about were conducted in the 70s through the 90s, and these patients were not always getting even tested for hormone positivity, and we weren't really using endocrine therapy. Remember, in NSABPB6, they were using this outdated chemotherapy uh, regimen. And so let's now talk about the role of endocrine therapy, and we'll talk about a key trial that showed that radiation plus tamoxifen improves ipsilateral breast tumor recurrence compared to radiation alone. NSABP21 is this uh, trial that compared lumpectomy plus radiation versus lumpectomy plus tamoxifen 
versus lumpectomy followed by both radiation and five years of tamoxifen. And the way that you can remember NSAPP B21, uh, 21 is kind of a coming of age, right? You are legal to drink alcohol at that age. Um, so 21, associate that with the coming of age. And now we're finally adding this drug. We're adding tamoxifen, which is an endocrine therapy um, that kind of takes our adjuvant treatment of breast cancer to the next level. So in NSABP 21, they took about 1,000 women with early stage breast cancer. So these tumors were small. They were less than or equal to one centimeter. And these were treated with lumpectomy and axillary lymph node dissection. And they included both estrogen receptor positive and negative patients. And there were three arms. So after the lumpectomy and lymph node dissection, patients were either randomized to receive tamoxifen alone, uh, 10 milligrams BID for five years, radiation alone to 50 gray, or radiation plus tamoxifen. And what they found is that there was no difference in overall survival. Um, it was about 80% in all arms. There was no benefit in tumors that were estrogen receptor negative. But um, across all the patients, they did see a significant improvement in the eight-year cumulative incidence of ipsilateral breast tumor recurrence. So with tamoxifen alone in the adjuvant setting, the recurrence was around 16%. With radiation alone, the recurrence was around 9%. And with tamoxifen plus radiation, the ipsilateral breast tumor recurrence at eight years was 3%, less than 3% actually. So at eight years, um, this trial clearly showed a benefit to the addition of tamoxifen plus radiation in the adjuvant setting uh, for hormone-positive breast cancers. Um, there's a small note to this trial. At 14 years, um, it actually lost significance. The benefit of tamoxifen plus radiation kind of disappeared. The ipsilateral breast tumor occurrence was 30% in the tamoxifen alone versus 11% and 10% with radiation alone or tamoxifen plus radiation. But at eight years, we do see that significant benefit, and that's kind of the numbers to memorize. 16% with tamoxifen alone versus 9% with radiation alone versus 3% with the radiation plus the tamoxifen, and that was a very significant improvement. So NSABP B21, that's our coming-of-age trial. We are now adding this modern endocrine therapy for hormone-positive cancers, and we find out that radiation plus tamoxifen imp improves ipsilateral breast tumor recurrence compared to either modality alone. Additionally, um, they found that tamoxifen actually decreases the risk of developing breast cancer on the contralateral side. So with radiation, you just get that local control benefit on the ipsilateral side, with the tamoxifen, you get an improvement on the contralateral side as well. Okay, so far we now have this trend towards kind of de-escalating our therapy. So we went from a radical mastectomy to a total mastectomy to breast conserving surgery. We found out that adding radiation plus tamoxifen for hormone positive patients decreases the risk of local recurrence after lumpectomy. Um, and we're still at this point, all these trials you'll notice are still doing a lumpectomy and they're doing a full axillary lymph node dissection. Now, what's the problem with axillary lymph node dissection? You take out all those lymph nodes and then patients get lymphedema, right? Um, they can also get shoulder um, mobility dysfunction. And so in order to try and decrease those side effects from the invasive axillary lymph node dissection, the next question is, can we manage the axilla in kind of a less invasive way. And so the question is, can we do sentinel lymph node biopsy instead and maybe use regional nodal irradiation if that sentinel lymph node biopsy turns out to be positive? And it turns out that sentinel lymph node biopsy plus regional nodal irradiation, if there's something positive, is actually less toxic with equivalent survival outcomes compared to the axillary lymph node dissection. And so... Um, let us get into some of these trials and kind of understand uh, the evidence behind this. NSABP32 was the trial that compared axillary lymph node dissection to sentinel lymph node biopsy guided axillary lymph node dissection. 
So this trial ran in the early 2000s in the pre-ultrasound era. So at this time, patients were not getting clinical axillary staging with an ultrasound. It was just based on exam. And they took 5,000 women with invasive breast cancer, clinical stages T1 to 3, clinically node negative based on exam. And they randomized them to either sentinel lymph node biopsy plus axillary lymph node dissection for everyone or sentinel lymph node biopsy plus a completion dissection only if they had positive findings on the sentinel lymph node biopsy. They used two techniques um, for sentinel lymph node um, location. So it was both the radioactive colloid with the technetium-99 as well as isosulfan blue dye. And 82% of the patients in both arms ended up uh, receiving radiation. So sentinel lymph node biopsy ended up having an overall accuracy of around 97%, a false negative rate of just under 10%, and a negative predictive value of around 96%. Importantly, there were no differences in the overall survival, the disease-free survival, or the local regional control, and their morbidity results actually showed significantly less uh, shoulder abduction deficits, changes in arm volume, and numbness and tingling with the sentinel lymph node approach. So sentinel lymph node biopsy based on NSABP B32 is a feasible approach, has a pretty good overall accuracy, and these patients, importantly, have much less lymphedema, shoulder dysfunction, as well as decreased arm numbness. And so if you want to remember NSABP B32 um, dealt with these the axillary lymph node versus sentinel lymph node biopsy, my silly way of remembering it is three, two, one are kind of the levels of the axilla. And so that's how you know that they were dealing with the axillary management comparing lymph adenectomy to sentinel lymph node biopsy. Now the question is, what do we do if that sentinel lymph node biopsy turns out to be positive, right? In NSABP B32, if it was positive, they went ahead and got a completion lymphadenectomy. The AMAROS trial uh, took patients with T1 to T2 and up to three sentinel lymph node positive um, lymph nodes. So uh, ITCs, uh, isolated tumor cells, remember those are tumor cells that are less than 0.2 millimeters in size. These did not count for the AMAROS trial. It was just if they had either microscopic nodes, so 0.2 to 2 millimeters or greater than 2 millimeters, and they could have up to three of these. So T1 to T2 disease, up to three sentinel lymph nodes that were positive, and they were randomized to either completion lymphadenectomy, as they had an NSABP B32, or comprehensive regional nodal irradiation. And so the comprehensive regional nodal irradiation was found to be non-inferior to lymphadenectomy with less lymphedema compared to the axillary lymph node dissection arm. So the 10-year local regional recurrence rates were just around 3.5% in both arms. The 3-year the 10-year, sorry, axillary recurrence rates were just around 1% in both arms. And the lymphedema, importantly, and this is an important number to know, the lymphedema at five years was 23% with axillary lymph node dissection versus 11% with regional nodal irradiation. So am a rose, think a rose is a flower, it's a beautiful thing. And so it's a beautiful thing that these patients with positive sentinel lymph nodes, up to three nodes, did not need completion axillary lymph node dissection, but just comprehensive regional irradiation could take the place of that with no significant difference in the local regional recurrence and half as much lymphedema, 23% down to 11%. And so that is the AMAROS trial. There's another trial uh, called the ACASOG Z11 trial. Um, that kind of looked at the same thing, and the idea was to randomize patients with positive nodes to either completion lymph node dissection versus no dissection and no regional nodal irradiation. Um, but I think that these results are a little bit confusing, so let me try to explain what ACASOG Z11 did. 
So in ACASOG Z11, they took patients with clinical T1 to T2 N0 disease and 1 to 2 positive sentinel lymph nodes. So very similar to Amaros, but just 1 to 2 positive nodes instead of up to 3, the way they had in Amaros. And then they randomized them to either completion axillary lymph node dissection or no axillary lymph node dissection. The protocol specified that the patients should get adjuvant whole breast or radiation with tangents only. They prohibited uh, supraclavicular or targeted axillary radiation. So ideally, this would have been a trial looking at sentinel lymph nodes positive, you have up to two nodes positive, and then you either get a completion axillary lymph node dissection or nothing with just whole breast radiation using tangents only. Interestingly, um, first of all, the trial did not complete accrual. They found out that on axillary lymph node dissection, up to 21% had three or more positive nodes. Um, and when they looked, when they did a su secondary analysis of the study, um, they found out that 89% of the patients received whole breast ra irradiation. And of these, half of the patients were actually treated with high tangents. So with high tangents, you're actually including levels one and two of the axilla. And moreover, 20% actually received protocol prohibited regional lymph node or radiation. Um, and then there was no significant difference in how the radiation was delivered between the axillary lymph node versus the sentinel lymph node biopsy arms. So the results of the study, um, ACASOG Z11, showed that the 10-year overall survival was not inferior. It was 84% versus 86%, no significant difference. There was no significant difference in the disease-free survival either. It was right around 80%. Um, and I think that the way that the trial was designed, they were trying to show that the patients could just be treated with adjuvant whole breast or radiation, but the results are a little bit muddied by the fact that 50% of the patients were treated with high tangents and 20% received protocol prohibited regional nodal irradiation. So ACASOG Z11 always confused me for a little bit. I think that the key takeaway from Amaros and ACASOG Z11 is that if we have um, sentinel lymph node biopsy that is positive and we have up to three nodes, we don't necessarily need completion axillary lymph node dissection. Um, sentinel lymph node biopsy followed by regional nodal irradiation um, has, no, has non-inferior outcomes and it approximately halves the rate of the lymphedema versus axillary lymph node dissection. So NSABP B32 compared axillary lymph node dissection to sentinel lymph node biopsy. And then Amaros and ACASOG Z11 showed us that adding um, adjuvant regional nodal irradiation, or in the case of ACASOG Z11, either high tangents or regional nodal irradiation, kind of resulted in non-inferior um, disease-free survival and improved toxicity with significantly decreased lymphedema. Let's talk now about a couple of other trials um, that give us additional evidence for regional nodal irradiation in certain high-risk patients by offering a disease-free survival benefit. MA20 is the first of these trials that's very important to know, and the MA20 trial compared regional nodal irradiation versus whole breast irradiation alone. So this trial ran in the early 2000s, and they took just under 2,000 patients with higher risk disease, okay? So these patients um, were either high risk node negative, so they had to have a tumor greater than 5 centimeters, remember that makes you T3, or they had a tumor greater than 2 centimeters with less than 10 nodes removed, and either a risk factor of high grade, ER negativity, or LVSI. So these are now, they're still early stage, but they are higher risk patients at this point. Or they were, so they were either high risk node negative with those factors, or they were node positive. And all of these patients had at least sentinel lymph node biopsy, or they had axillary lymph node dissection with, um, a level one to two axillary lymph node dissection if they were sentinel lymph node biopsy positive. 
Also, all of these patients had systemic treatment. So we are now looking at early stage patients, but higher risk. In the node positive group, any patients that were sentinel lymph node biopsy positive ended up having axillary lymph node dissection, and 85% of these patients ended up having one to three positive nodes, um, with only 5% of them having um, four or more nodes. So early stage, high risk patients, either node negative with risk factors including a larger tumor size or smaller tumor size, but grade three ER negative or LVSI. These patients were randomized to either get adjuvant whole breast radiation alone to 50 gray or whole breast irradiation plus comprehensive nodal irradiation. So the regional nodal irradiation included the undissected axilla, supraclavicular nodes, and IMNs. The only time they included the dissected axilla was if less than 10 nodes were sampled or the patients had four or more positive nodes. They compared the results at 10 years and found that there was no significant difference in survival with regional nodal irradiation. So the overall survival was 82% in both groups. However, the disease-free survival was significantly improved in the regional nodal irradiation group by just around 5%. So the disease-free survival was 82% with regional nodal irradiation versus 77% without. So there was a 5% DFS benefit seen with regional nodal irradiation. Now, what about toxicity? So acutely, there was significantly worse pneumonitis seen with RNI, and the numbers are small, but they're significant. So 1.2% versus 0.2%. Um, and there was also worse dermatitis in the acute setting. In the long term, uh, regional nodal irradiation led to worse lymphedema. So 8% versus 4%. Now keep in mind, it's still not bad as over 20% risk seen with axillary lymph node dissection, but um, there is worse lymphedema with regional nodal irradiation. And also these patients did, you know, a lot of them did end up having axillary lymph node dissection as well. So the big takeaway from the MA20 trial, these are early stage patients with high risk breast cancer. And we find that there's a 5% disease-free survival benefit with the addition of regional lymph node irradiation, but no overall survival benefit. So this gives us some evidence for treating patients with these high-risk features with regional nodal irradiation. The other trial that often gets lumped together with MA20 because it's kind of similar is the EORTC22922 trial. So similar to MA20, this patient took this trial took patients with early stage but kind of higher risk disease. Um, and they randomized them to either get either whole breast or chest wall irradiation alone versus whole breast or chest wall irradiation with regional nodal irradiation. So this trial took patients with a lateral tumor that was clinically node positive or a medial tumor that was that may or may not have been node positive. So they allowed for node negative patients with a medial tumor, and they randomized them to these two treatment arms. It turned out that around 43% of them had uh, clinically node positive disease and 44% of them had medial tumors that were N0. At 10 years, they similarly saw a small disease-free survival improvement with regional nodal irradiation. In this case, it was a 3% DFS benefit, 72% versus 69% with the regional nodal irradiation. So 3% DFS benefit. Um, it turns out that the number needed to treat was 30 patients. So you treat 30 patients with RNI to avoid one relapse. And they actually lost significance at the 15-year follow-up. There was no significant difference in the 10-year overall survival, but the 15-year breast cancer mortality actually improved with regional nodal irradiation. So 20% mortality without RNI versus 16% with the RNI. In terms of toxicity at 10 years, they saw worse pulmonary fibrosis at, um, in the long term, so 4% versus 2% with the RNI, but they saw no difference in second cancers or contralateral breast cancer. So 
what does EORTC 22922 tell us? It also adds some evidence that for these early stage higher risk patients, adding regional nodal irradiation provides a small but significant disease-free survival benefit. In this case, it was 3%. There is no overall survival benefit. In this trial at 15 years, there was also significant improvement in breast cancer-specific mortality. Let's summarize what we know so far then about regional nodal irradiation in early stage breast cancer. So based on the Amaros and ACASOG Z11 trials, we know that for patients that have positive nodes on sentinel lymph node biopsy, we can probably omit completion axillary lymph node dissection and pursue regional nodal irradiation because it offers equivalent local control and significantly less lymphedema. The MA20 and the EORTC22922 trials then add additional support for regional nodal irradiation in certain early stage patients that have either node positive disease or high risk features. So who are these patients? So I think of kind of stage two patients, uh, right? Because stage two patients are either T1 to T2 with N1 disease, so one to three axillary lymph nodes, or they're T3N0. Remember that if you have T3N positive disease or anything with four or more lymph nodes, considered PN2, that makes you stage three. So that would then be locally advanced breast cancer. And those patients will be the subject of a completely different um, lecture. But in this case, we're thinking about early stage, so stage two patients with high risk features. And it helps to know the inclusion criteria of these two trials. So for MA20, they included tumors greater than five centimeters, so T3, or tumors that were T2 with less than 10 nodes removed and one of the following risk factors, so either ER negative, high grade, or LVSI. In the EORTC22922 trial, they included lateral tumors that were clinically node positive or medial tumors, and they could have been node positive or negative. So it's unclear from these trials whether or not every patient with clinically node positive disease that's early stage benefits from regional nodal irradiation or if there's actually a subset of patients that derive benefits. And so you might see that practice patterns vary depending on the physician, depending on the institution. There's also an ongoing Taylor RT trial that may help to add some clarity, especially for hormone positive low risk patients. Just briefly, let's talk about the ongoing Taylor RT trial. This is a phase three international multi-center um, randomized trial. Um, that's looking at using the Oncotype score to try and determine if we can omit adjuvant regional nodal irradiation in hormone-positive patients that have one to three positive nodes if they have a low-risk Oncotype score, so Oncotype less than or equal to 25. You might recall from the breast cancer overview lecture, we talked about the Taylor RX trial that looked at using the Oncotype score to determine um, the need for adjuvant um, chemotherapy in node negative patients. There was also the RX Sponder trial that looked at the same thing in node positive patients. So Taylor RT is a similar trial, um, but the specific question is for patients with T1 to T2 N1 disease. So they allow patients with one to three nodes if they have an axillary lymph node dissection or one to two nodes if they undergo a sentinel lymph node biopsy, or patients with T3N0 disease. So these are similar to the patients that were enrolled in MA20. The patients have to be ER positive, so ER greater than or equal to 1%, and HER2 negative, and they undergo oncotype testing, and they have to have an oncotype DX score of less than or equal to 25 because these patients are considered low risk. If they meet these criteria, they are then being randomized to whole breast irradiation or post mastectomy radiation, depending on what surgery they get, versus um, whole breast or chest wall radiation plus regional nodal irradiation. So Taylor RT is asking this exact question that kind of comes from the MA20 and EORTC trials. Is there a subset of patients that have low nodal burden or T3N0 breast cancer?
um, in the ER positive, low risk, um, based on the oncotype cohort, that can avoid regional nodal irradiation. And so these results will be very interesting to see. All right, we are close to the end here. So we have talked about patients with early stage breast cancer that have certain high risk features and talked about how these patients may benefit from regional nodal irradiation because there's a disease-free survival benefit. The next question is, on the flip side, are there patients with such low risk early stage breast cancer that we can actually think about omitting radiation? And so we'll talk about the trials that look into this question. And the takeaway from these trials is that yes, there are certain patients in which we might consider omitting radiation, um, but no matter what, radiation, even in the lowest risk patients, radiation still confers a significant local control benefit. So it ends up being a risk benefit decision with patients and we counsel them that radiation improves local control. And if we think that the patients have a good enough performance status and a good enough overall life expectancy, that it might be worth doing the radiation anyway. So let's get into some of these trials and explain uh, kind of the rationale for this thought process. The first of these trials is CALGB 9343. This looked at patients that had hormone positive stage one breast cancer and randomized them to either get endocrine therapy alone or endocrine therapy with radiation. And these had to be low risk patients. So who was included in this trial? That's an important question to ask. So they took elderly patients with age 70 or higher, right? Because in breast cancer, we know that younger patients are at higher risk and older patients tend to be at lower risk. So the patients have to be on the older side. In this trial, they were age 70 or older and they had tumors that were two centimeters or smaller and they had to be estrogen receptor positive because all of these patients got endocrine therapy. They also had to have a lumpectomy with negative margins defined as no tumor on ink. And we actually don't know what the grades were. They never revealed the distribution of the grades. So the inclusion criteria for this particular omission of radiation study was age 70 or older, tumor 2 centimeter or smaller, estrogen receptor positive, and negative margins. And the patients were randomized to either receive tamoxifen alone, 20 milligrams daily for five years, or tamoxifen plus whole breast irradiation. And the results showed that the tamoxifen plus radiation group had significantly longer time to local regional recurrence. The 10-year local regional recurrence was 10% for tamoxifen alone versus 2% for tamoxifen plus radiotherapy, and that was statistically significant. There was, however, no significant difference in overall survival, disease-free survival, or mastectomy-free survival. So CALGB 9343 was kind of the first study of omitting radiotherapy in early stage favorable risk breast cancer. So age 70 or older, a small tumor, two centimeters or smaller, estrogen receptor positive, and negative margins. This study showed that there was a 10% risk of ipsilateral breast tumor recurrence with tamoxifen alone versus 2% with tamoxifen and radiation, but no significant difference in the overall survival or disease-free survival. So let me go through the next study too, and then we'll talk about how we kind of interpret and apply these studies. Kind of around the same time that PRIME, sorry, that CALGB was happening, the PRIME2 study was happening, and this is the other key trial um, of omission of radiation. So this trial was very, very similar to CALGB 9343 with some small differences. So instead of taking patients age 70 or older, PRIME2 took patients ages 65 or older. Uh, they had to be estrogen and or uh, progesterone receptor positive. They allowed for a tumor size less than or equal to three centimeters, and they specified their margins had to be negative by at least one millimeter. And they did report on the grade, and only 2 to 3% actually had grade 3 disease in the PRIME2 trial. It was a very similar randomization, so they either received tamoxifen 20 milligrams daily for 5 years or some other endocrine therapy, or they received tamoxifen plus radiation. 
and the results at five-year follow-up showed a significant improvement in local control. So ipsilateral breast tumor recurrence was 4% with tamoxifen versus 1% with tamoxifen and radiotherapy. And at 10 years, it was very similar to CALGB, 10% with tamoxifen alone versus 1% with tamoxifen and radiation. The overall survival and disease-free survival were not significantly different between the groups. So CALGB and PRIME2 were kind of the two studies of omission that are key. I just remember PRIME2 is number two, and I just think of it as being a little bit better than CALGB in all the ways because it included slightly younger patients, so now we have a bigger inclusion criteria. It included slightly larger tumors, so again, expands that inclusion criteria up to three centimeters. And additionally, they actually did report on the grade. So we know that only 2 to 3% were grade 3. Um, so that's kind of how I remember the difference between CALGB and PRIME2. And again, the key finding is that it's still telling us that omission of radiation offers a low local regional recurrence, so only 10% at 10 years, but it is significantly improved with the addition of radiation, so all the way down to 1%. So how do we interpret these studies and how do we make decisions with patients about what to do with their treatment plan? I think the key thing to remember is that when these trials were being conducted, the CALGB9343 and the PRIME2 trials, this was in an era of conventional radiotherapy where radiotherapy was delivered every day Monday through Friday for a period of five to six weeks. In the modern day, and we will discuss these different regimens that are now available in our discussion of um, breast cancer fractionation, um, but for now, you know, keep in mind that in the modern day, we utilize hypofractionation much more often. So our longest regimens are three weeks of radiation, 15 to 16 fractions given over three weeks, with maybe a four to five fraction boost if there's high risk features. The shortest radiation regimens that we do, and most of the time these patients are candidates for these very short regimens, only involve one week of radiotherapy, so five fractions for a week given every day, Monday through Friday, and we can do both partial breast irradiation as well as whole breast irradiation. So that's one huge factor to consider is that these omission of radiation trials were at that time, very important because you're saving the patient five to six weeks of radiotherapy. At this point, we're often just talking about one week of treatment, which is much less financially toxic and, and much more doable for a lot of patients, right? The other very important question to consider is the question of hormonal therapy. So both CALGB and PRIME2 in the arm that did not receive any radiation they still required the patients to take five years of endocrine therapy. And endocrine therapy is not without side effects. Endocrine therapy actually has a lot of side effects and you know, significant morbidity for patients just from that therapy alone. And so it's it's when you're talking to these patients, um, you know, you have to make sure that they would be compliant with the endocrine therapy for five years. And you also have to counsel them that even with five years of endocrine therapy and the radiation, there was a significant improvement in local control. And for a lot of patients, even if they're 65, 70 years old or older, um, they, these patients still have very good performance status and they have a very good life expectancy. And so a lot of them, that significant improvement down from 10% down to 1% to 2%, is a huge improvement in ipsilateral breast tumor recurrence, and it matters to patients that have good performance status. So these are all things that you have to kind of take into consideration when you're counseling patients. I want to make note of two additional studies um, that are kind of in the either ongoing or recently published. So one recently published study was the Lumina A study. Uh, which actually looked at patients 55 or older with luminal A breast cancer and omission RT. And in this trial, they actually found that the risk of local failure was 2.3%, which was almost the same as the risk in the contralateral breast, which was around 2%. Um, and they took T1N0 grade 1 to 2 luminal A breast cancer, 
although the average age in that trial was around 70, six, sorry, 67%. There's also a recently published IDEA trial, um, which looked at patients ages 50 to 69 that were hormone positive, HER2 negative, and had a low oncotype score. And this was a single arm trial of radiation omission. And their five-year freedom from any recurrence was 99%. So there are still kind of ongoing trials. And as our, um, you know, as our risk stratification gets better with things like oncotype, we can kind of better use those to identify patients that truly won't benefit um, from the addition of radiation. Um, so keep in mind that this is kind of an ongoing area of investigation. The other study that I think is very interesting is the ongoing Europa study, which asks the question five days or five years. And so this is actually a non-inferiority trial that's randomizing patients over 70 um, with clinical T1 and zero disease. And they're randomizing them to either partial breast irradiation for five days or endocrine therapy for five years. Um, so that'll be an interesting study to follow. So the major takeaways from our discussion of omission of radiation trials for low-risk early-stage breast cancer. Patients that are 65 years or older um, are kind of the main trials that have been done. These patients have to be hormone positive. They have to have stage 1 tumors. Note that prime 2 allowed tumors up to 3 centimeters in size. The ipsilateral breast tumor recurrence does significantly improve from around 10% to 1% to 2% which these are important numbers to counsel patients about. Um, with modern day radiotherapy, our treatment only takes one to maybe three to four weeks at the most, but most of these patients are eligible for just five days of treatment. And we have a fairly low toxicity profile with our five days of treatment. Additionally, if we have to omit radiation, these patients still have to take five uh, years of endocrine therapy. And so it's really important to counsel them about that because in both of these omission trials, the patients received five full years of endocrine therapy. So the ongoing Europa study will be interesting to follow to see if five days of radiation is non-inferior to five years of endocrine therapy. In terms of um, patients that are higher risk, so patients that would benefit from a boost, such as young age, high grade, triple negative, it's important to keep in mind that we would not be offering these patients omission anyways because they have these high risk factors. So just, it's very important to kind of keep in mind that this entire discussion has been about early stage breast cancer, but um, within that, there are kind of lower risk patients and then there are higher risk patients as well. So some concluding thoughts, because I know that this has been a beast of a lecture with a lot, a lot, a lot of information. I think the huge takeaways, the biggest takeaways um, are here listed on this slide. So number one, we know that radiation improves local control after surgery. In the older studies that we talked about, NSABPB6 and the EBCTCG meta-analysis, the Local recurrence goes from about 35 to 40% with lumpectomy alone, down to 15 to 20%. In the modern era, it's more like 15% down to 8% with radiation alone, down to 2 to 3% with radiation and endocrine therapy, or any other systemic therapy that we might offer. So radiation offers a lo local control benefit. Boost. We know that tumor bed boost improves ipsilateral breast tumor recurrence in everyone at the cost of worse fibrosis and as also worse telangiectasias. And so we try to prioritize the boost and give it to patients that will have the best benefit, the greatest magnitude of benefit. And so these patients tend to be younger in age, and our guidelines reflect that. So young age, age less than or equal to 50, high-grade disease, or positive margins. These are kind of the three main things to remember for who gets a boost. And then there's some other nuanced features too that we did talk about. In terms of the regional nodal irradiation, the question of regional nodal irradiation, I think the first step to remember is that we de-escalated from axillary lymph node dissection to sentinel lymph node biopsy followed by regional nodal irradiation in the case of node-positive disease. And we discussed the trials um, such as Amaros, which showed that sentinel lymph node biopsy plus regional nodal irradiation had equivalent outcome and better toxicity compared to axillary lymph node dissection.
There are some patients that might have low risk disease and low nodal burden who may not need regional nodal irradiation after a positive sentinel lymph node biopsy, um, or even if they have T3 and 0 disease, and that is the subject of the ongoing Taylor RT trial for hormone positive patients. Um, and so that'll be interesting to follow. And then finally, on the flip side of these higher risk patients, we have low risk patients with early stage disease that um, we asked the question of, can we actually get away with omitting radiation? And what we found out from the CALGB and the PRIME2 studies is that even in these low-risk patients, there is still a significant local control benefit from radiation. And the addition of radiation improves local control from 10% down to 1% to 2%. So if choosing omission, it's really important to counsel patients on, first of all, the fact that radiation only takes five days, Second of all, the toxicity profile is not that bad. It offers a drastic local control benefit, which is still very important for patients that have good performance status. And those patients still have to take endocrine therapy for five years. So most of the time in the modern era, we still end up treating these patients with usually just five days of radiation. And so those are kind of my big takeaways from everything that we have discussed so far. Thank you so much. Uh, If you have been listening this long, I hope that this was helpful to you. I feel like I have to clarify, again, we did not go through every single trial in the early stage breast cancer space. That would be far too impossible. Um, There is a a huge depth of trials that we probably could get into that we did not get into here. Um, But my hope was to kind of provide highlights from some of the most important trials that kind of guide our clinical decision making. And you know, try to explain these in a, in a logical way and, and try to rationalize why we do what we do based on the available evidence that we have. So I really hope you found this helpful and thank you so much for your time and attention.